My next question comes from Benjamin, who wanted to know about a term often used to derisively refer to products made with potential monetary intent. Where did the term cash grab originate from? That's an interesting question, as many of us have probably used cash grab to refer to a movie or television show or book that seems to exist because someone potentially wanted more money in their bank account. I did try to search for the earliest use of the term cash grab, but I came up short. With that said, it's a fairly universal term now, but how accurate is it? It's easy to look at a sequel, for example, and believe it exists because its predecessor turned a profit. I confess to once calling Alvin and the Chipmunks the Squeakwell a cash grab, something that was unfounded. One, because I had not seen the Squeakwell, and I based this purely on my strong dislike for the first Alvin movie, and two, because I was probably unaware of the filmmaker's intent. Yes, this second entry in the series came about because the first movie was a massive hit, grossing $360 million on a $60 million production budget. Anyone running 20th Century Fox at the time would have probably okayed a sequel, regardless of the artistic merit. However, even if the studio financing and releasing the sequel were clearly hoping to repeat or maybe even double the box office success of Avon and the Chipmunks, that does not mean the filmmakers themselves had dollar signs in their eyes. Betty Thomas is quite the accomplished director of a number of notable feature film and television directing credits to her name. And with Alvin too, she got to show her skill at making a film where the principal characters are computer generated and interact with real people. I'm sure Jason Lee was paid quite well for his role as Dave Seville. But he also took on the film so he could have movies his children could actually watch. Listen, I love Morax and Dogma, but I do not blame him for wanting to show his son something else. Do I think Alvin and the Chipmunks The Squeakwell is a good film? Not particularly, but I now hesitate to call it a cash grab. But it is an easy blanket term to apply to projects like this. A lot of people think these sorts of IP-inspired films and shows are born out of executive boardrooms. Maybe sometimes, but not always. Herbie Fully Loaded was not a well-received continuation of a known Disney property, so it's often called a cash grab. It's easy to imagine Michael Eisner or some other Disney higher-up going over what they own and deciding, hey, let's do another Herbie movie. However, the idea of doing another Herbie movie actually came from writers Thomas Lennon and Robert Ben Garrett. They both wrote an excellent book called Writing Movies for Fun and Profit, and there's an entire chapter dedicated to their participation in Fully Loaded. To keep it short, they were huge fans of the earlier movies and wanted to see another Herbie movie. So they pitched the film to Disney, and Nina Jacobson, the head of the studio at the time, loved the idea. They wrote a script which was well received, but then other executives came in with their own ideas, and eventually Lennon and Garand were replaced. They were then rehired, only to find their drafts been almost entirely rewritten. Even if they were disappointed in the final product, they still thought highly of the director and the filmmaking team as well as Jacobson. Herbie Fully Loaded, to them, just became another sequel meant to cash in on a familiar brand. Funnily enough, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse went the exact opposite route towards its final form. The idea for that film originated with former Sony Pictures president Amy Pascal, who wanted to utilize Spider-Man in an animated film separate from the live-action blockbusters. That sure seemed like just another way to cash in on this popular superhero Sony owns the film rights to. But she then offered it to Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, who then hired the directors Rodney Rothman, Peter Ramsey, and Bob Persichetti. They got input from all over Sony, including current president Tom Rothman and other higher-ups, and the result was something many people assumed would be a mere cash grab, but instead became widely beloved by a lot of people. The truth is, every movie is technically a cash grab, even original ideas that came from a filmmaker's imagination. Very rarely does a studio greenlight a movie and want nothing in return. Even something like Schindler's List, Universal only bought the film rights to the book because Steven Spielberg, who had such a Midas touch, was heavily interested. But I believe it is possible for art and commerce 
to coexist. I hope I answered your question the best that I could, Benjamin.